draw us closer to yourself. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the cross. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Uh, and as you're flipping there, uh, I'm going to need you not to fall asleep this morning because you have that gentle, uh, nice rain on a tin roof sound above us. I know it's uh, relaxing, but uh, just stay with me for a few minutes and we will, uh, we will make it through, I promise. But anyway, and as you're flipping there, there to Ruth, it is uh, right after the book of Judges, right before the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, and if you have a hard time, uh, don't be ashamed to go to the table of contents in the front of the Bible and find where it is. And so uh, no judgment here at Crosspoint. If somebody looks at you weird, uh, you have my permission to punch them in the face. Uh, just kidding. Just tell me and I'll punch them in the face. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, so yeah, Book of Ruth. And also uh, this week, uh, Luke will be headed down to Foley, Alabama to preach a youth retreat. Uh, and so let's be in prayer for him as we go. Hey, by the way, go and get used to this. You're going to hear me say that a lot. And so a part of him being on staff here is uh, him go, he's going out and us as a church, uh, he, he knows he's got a home. We got a, he's got a body that's praying for him. And so we're going to keep you up uh, in, in the loop as much as we, uh, we think about it. He will be here next Sunday. He'll preach next Sunday. Uh, and so he'll, he'll continue Ruth's series next week. But anyway, we'll be lifting him up this week. So Ruth, we're going to spend uh, the next nine weeks in the book of Ruth. Uh, it will carry us to August the 1st, uh, and so as long as Luke and I don't get too long, no promises, too long-winded on one of those Sundays, it's projected to be nine weeks, but you know us well enough that it may go 10, 12. Anyway, but right now we're looking at nine weeks, and so I am excited about jumping in uh, to this Old Testament narrative. And so this morning, it's really an, an introductory type uh, morning. This morning, I'm going to introduce you uh, to the book of Ruth. I'm going to introduce you to the way that Luke and I are going to teach through the book of Ruth, uh, and we will, I will introduce you to um, almost all but one main character through the whole, the whole book. The book doesn't have many characters in it. Uh, this morning in the first five verses, uh, we meet most of them, everybody except uh, Boaz. And so Anyway, so yeah, this morning, like I said, it's going to be kind of an introductory. We're going to kind of set up, uh, get our, our minds going in the same direction. Uh, we have called this study uh, Not Forsaken. Uh, not Forsaken, whenever we began to pray through and look through, uh, it was really funny. We were in my office this past week, and uh, we were thinking, what are we going to call this? Because to be good preachers, you got to have clever names. Uh, you just can't preach a sermon series anymore called Ruth. It has to have a name on it. And so we do our due diligence and coming up with a name for it. And, and, you know, so I do what every, I guess, my age person do. I go to Facebook or go to the Google and start Google. What do other people call uh, the, their study of the book of Ruth? And then Luke being the senior saint in the, in the office, he says, let's just look at the Bible. And there it is, uh, Naomi actually prays, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living. And so there it went. And so really the book of Ruth is about a story. It's a story that's more than a romance. I know a lot of times we, call, we talk about it in, in, in context of romance, but it's, it's really the story about God being faithful. Uh, it's really the story about God being faithful to his promise, but also to his people. Uh, that Because ultimately, the nation of Israel, where they were at that moment, God would have been just in forsaking them. There was a moment in Naomi's life that she thought she had had to have been forsaken. Ruth, the same picture. Their, their families, their story, their, their bloodline, it seems like all hope is lost. But what we see at the end is that God had not forsaken them. He had forsaken the nation of Israel. He had not forsaken Naomi or Ruth. No matter how they felt in that moment, he's a God who did not forsake them. So that's kind of where the name comes from. Uh, as I always do, I'm going to give you the goals of this series. And so if you're taking notes, number one, the reason why we want to teach through the book of Ruth is so that we can see the greater storyline of Scripture. 
Uh, we, we talk about this often, and it's very easy for us just to camp out in the New Testament and then begin to look at like the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are two different gods, two different stories. And one thing that we've been trying to communicate over the past year or year and a half or so is that the scripture is one storyline. It's a storyline of redemption. And is there, there is, New Testament, Old Testament, there is really no greater book that shows, teaches redemption than the book of Ruth. And so I'm excited about that. So as we go through, hoping that we as a church begin to see that, that, that from Genesis to Revelation, it is one storyline of redemption. It isn't two different stories. The second goal is that, that we would know redemption, that we would actually be able to see redemption in the, in, in the affairs of, of Naomi and, and Ruth and Boaz, that we will actually see tangibly what it means when the Lord redeems us. Uh, what is the, give us an actual picture of a story that we can see this is what redemption is. And by redemption, we're going to see God's kindness. That's what Naomi prays there. We'll see his kindness, which we are, we are defining as God's desire to redeem. Then we'll also see God's sovereignty, which we are labeling God's ability to accomplish that redemption. And so through this, we will see that God, in his kindness, uh, he has a heart, he has a love. Uh, but not only does he have kindness, but he is sovereign. Not only does he have the heart to save, but he also has the power to save. Uh, he, he is sovereign enough to be able to actually accomplish what his heart desires. And we'll see that all through this book. Number three that I want you, the goals for this series is this, is that we will see that God does not forsake his promise or his people. He does not forsake his promise or his people, no matter how dire the situation looks. No matter how hopeless or helpless the situation looks, God does not forsake his promise or his people. Let's read Ruth chapter one, verses one through five. It says this, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and, his, his name, and the name of his wife was Naomi. Uh, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephra, Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and they remained there. Notice they started as a sojourn, which says they're going to be there temporarily, and then they stayed there. So catch that. They remained there. Then, but, verse 3, Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, not Oprah, Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there. About 10 years, and both Milan and Kilion died, so, the, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Pray with me. Father, we love you. God, we looked uh, in our last series that your spirit is the one who guides us into truth. So God, we pray for your spirit to be with us today. God, we have felt his presence as we have joined together as he has led us to glory in Jesus this morning. So God, I pray that as we open your word, that he will give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Everybody said... Amen. And so, uh, the book of Ruth. So, what I'm going to do this morning first, I'm going to kind of give you a general introduction to Ruth. And so, uh, it, it, Ruth is made up of, of four chapters. And so, we will spend the next nine weeks through these four chapters. The way that we plan on doing is this morning, I'll be one through five. Next week, Luke will be in six through 18. And then on Father's Day, we'll do 19 through 22. And then we'll spend two weeks in chapter two, two weeks in chapter three and two weeks in chapter four. And so anyway, that's kind of how the breakdown is going to be over the next nine weeks. Uh, we can read from the first verse that we know that it takes place. So the actual story, this story that the author, that we believe to be Samuel, uh, we're not 100% sure on that, but that's what we believe because it fits uh, the, what's going on. But uh, it was during the time of the judges. We don't know exactly at what point that is. We just know it was from the time they got to the, between the time they got to the promised land and before there was a king. Somewhere in there, we know for sure that that's when this story took place. 
It's built on mostly dialogue between the characters. Apart from really the first five verses, all we see throughout the whole thing is conversations and dialogues uh, that are happening. I hate to bust your bubble, but it is more than a romantic movie. It's more than just a good story about a wife finding a husband. Now, that story is there, and it's a part of redemption, and it's a picture of Christ redeeming us. And so I don't want to make light of that, but it's, it's more than just something that warms our heart, uh, if you will. It's, it's a story of redemption. Actually, I, I, I choose to believe, I think that the main theme is to set up the bloodline of King David. Uh, because there we see the covenants happening, and that's the very last verse that we see in chapter four. If you flip over there real quick, it says, now these are the generations, uh, and it, go, it keeps going, and then verse 22 is uh, Obed, is who uh, Ruth uh, uh, births, and then the, the father Jesse, then Jesse, father David, and that's how the book ends. And so I think, uh, I think it really is a story of, of God setting up this kingship and us seeing it, but Redemption is there, and, and, and the love story is there as well. Uh, the book of Ruth is only one of two books that's named after a woman, uh, and uh, the crazy thing is Ruth was not an Israelite, and so the fact, A, that it was, a, it was named after a lady, but also a lady that wasn't an Israelite should catch our attention that, hey, this book's important, De- definitely for us Gentiles to read, by the way, uh, very important for us people who are not part of the promise. We should go, hey, this book's for us. Uh, but anyway, so uh, that's, that's that. Uh, really, Naomi, probably, uh, if you were going by main character, then Naomi probably would be should, who it would be named after, but obviously the Holy Spirit says, no, it's, it's Ruth, and so that's what we go with, but it's mostly about Naomi going from emptiness to fullness, and we see really from chapter one to chapter four just this journey that God takes her on. It does trace that journey from emptiness to fullness, but this is a story of God's faithfulness to his promise and his people, and it's a story that we're looking at through the lens of not forsaken. So that's just a little introduction to to the book of Ruth. If you're bored, just stay with me. We're actually going to get to the text in a little bit. If you're bored, then I'm sorry. Uh, The the, the next thing I want to talk about is I want to teach you how Luke and I are going to teach through this. Uh, That way, when every time we come in on Sunday for the next nine weeks, you know exactly what to expect and how the formula is going to play out and what we're going to do. But also, it's a great way for us to read the Bible individually. And so uh, this is the formula that we will use. This is, and the narrative's different than the New Testament. So when we go to the, to the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, man we, could, man, we can sit there and chew on and dig into and dive into, turn over every nook and cranny and things like that. Well, a narrative, now there's innuendos and things like that, but it's a story. It's a story for us to read and to talk about like a story, just if we were, if I was sitting down with Evie and reading her a story, it's something that we are to read through and to understand. And so it looks a little different. And so the first thing we ask ourselves is, what's the story? What's going on? What's the narrative? So each week we'll come in, we will read the narrative, we'll talk about the narrative. And then the second thing is, what's the truth? What is the author's goal here? What does it teach us about God and the world and man? And then The third thing is, how does this point to Christ? How does it fit into the greater line of scripture? So for the next nine weeks, that's kind of the outline of our sermons is, what's the story? What's going on? What's the truth to take home? And how does this point to Christ? So everybody good with me so far? All right. The story. Let's get to the story. So uh, Ruth chapter one, first of all, verse one. Uh, Let's talk about characters and context. And so, first of all, it starts off, and this is very important for us to catch. We have to catch this in this book uh, because it is very important. So he says, verse one, says, in the days when the judges ruled. And so the first thing we have to understand about the context that's going on, this is the same time that the, the, there was no king. That the, matter of fact, uh, the, the time that the judges rule is best described by the last verse in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, it says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. So everyone did what was right 
in his own eyes. And so in the context, when the book of Ruth happens, it's when the judges are the ones that are ruling, they're judging, if you will, and the summary of that time is that there was no king, so everybody did what they wanted to. Everybody just lived how they wanted to. Ultimately, the, the, the book of Judges is, the, is the, the summary of Israel's spiritual infidelity. It is them chasing after other gods, moving into idol worship, doing all kind of crazy things, forsaking God. And so it's in that context that we have the book of Ruth. And so therefore, when we read the book of Ruth in this beautiful, messy story, understanding that it's going on in a time in a world where Israel is a mess. They, they haven't been faithful, if you will. So the fact that we see this story of God's faithfulness is a beautiful thing for us to see about God's grace and his kindness. So it was in the, it was in the time that when the, it was in the days when the judges rule, verse one, there was a famine in the land. So not only where it was Israel a mess, now there's also a famine. Uh, we don't know what caused the famine, if it was a natural disaster, or if it was God's judgment on their disobedience, or if it was from the hands of an enemy. We don't know, but what we do know is that there was no food. There was nothing for them to eat, which is ironic because what is, does it say they're from? from Bethlehem, which literally means the house of bread. And so here you have this guy we're about to be introduced to and his two sons, his wife and two sons, they're from a place called house of bread that they have no bread. Their, their land is, their, their nation is a mess already. They're running to and fro. They're not worshiping the God they're created to. They have no food. Their situation is pretty Extreme. So, it's, so in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn. Sojourn really means to be a pilgrim. What ultimately, what this is teaching us is that, and this is another thing for we got to catch, is that when Elimelech led his family to this place, he didn't plan to stay there. But what we see is he ended up staying there longer than he originally planned. And so that's, just follow with that train of thought for a moment. He went just because maybe I'm just gonna go hang out for a little bit, the drought or the famine will be done soon, and so he didn't plan on staying, he just wanted to go wait it out. And so here's where the story gets even more interesting. I need you to follow with me. So in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, a man in Bethlehem, a man of Bethlehem and Judah, and Judah went to sojourn, went to pil be a pilgrim in the country of all places, a place called Moab. And if you ever read the Old Testament at all, you, what you'll see is that Moab wasn't the place to go. I, it was not the place you wanted to be. They were cursed by God for their own reasons. And actually, I'll, I'll read a little bit. Um, Moab was... Israel's weird cousins. I would just say it like that. They had a, they're, they're the weird cousins. Uh, and the fact that any Israelite would move there was astonishing. We should see the desperation in this moment and the dire circumstance for this Israelite to go to Moab. They was just southeast of the Dead Sea. So ultimately they were close enough to journey there, but they were far enough away that they weren't in drought. Evidently they had food. Israel didn't like the Moabites and God had cursed them. Here's five reasons, I can come up on the screen if you want it uh, later, I'll show you to you, but there are five reasons why Israel didn't really like Moab. Number one is because they had a sketchy beginning. Uh, if you know the story, you can, if you don't, read Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Moab started uh, by the ancestral relationship between Lot and his daughter. Uh, and so from that became Moab. Actually, Moab literally means, Mo means who, Ab means father. So literally their name is, who's your father? That's, a, that's their name. There's a, there's a weird situation that is starting. And so you can see that, hey, <laughs> that's my crazy cousin over there. You know, you, you have a family reunion and everybody's like, anyway, not that you have a, anyway, that's weird. Uh, depends on where you're from in Jones. Anyway, uh, I'll stop there. But here's the deal is that they were, they were their, their weird, they did, there was this Dane, they were, 
I don't know if you want to put them to the equivalent to the New Testament Samaritan, like they just did not want to be around them because of their, they came from a a sketchy place. We don't want to be associated with them. You can read that, Genesis 19. When Israel was passing through from Egypt to the promised land, Moabites didn't make it easy on them. They were constantly at war with them. You can look at that in Numbers 22 through 24. There was another time we read about Numbers 25 is that the Moabite women seduced the men. And because of that, all the, all the men who had, who had had an affair with the Moabite women, they were all hung. There was a serious consequence because of the sin of their interactions with Moab. That's Numbers 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, we see, we see that God tells the Israelites, really there's a constitutional exclusion of the Moabites from the assembly. God tells them, do not let them be a part of the assembly. And the, n- number five is that there was a recent oppression of Israel by Eglon, the king of Moab. We can read about it in Judges chapter three. And so there's a long story, long history of, for him, To go to this place, it must be a bad situation. Moab was rejected by God because of their idolatry and their treatment of Israel. That's what Numbers 13 teaches. This is because the way that Moab treated Israel is the reason why God had cut them off or cursed them, if you will. Child sacrifice was a part of their pagan religion. They were just a nasty group of people. They were accursed people. Here's the, write these passages down if you want to just see some of the, I don't have time to go all the way into it, but Isaiah 15 and 16, Jeremiah 48, Ezekiel 25, Amos 2, Numbers 13, really just talks about how cursed Moab was. But I do want to read this because this is important for Ruth's uh, Ruth's story in Isaiah 56. Abby, did I give you Isaiah 56? Okay. Isaiah 56, one through seven. So here's this, all those passages I gave you, there's a strong curse against Moab. And then Isaiah 56, we have this beautiful nugget and it's, it perfectly, perfectly fits the, the story of Ruth and Naomi. And so it says this in verse one, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness for soon. My salvation will come and my righteousness uh, be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of the who, oh man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Check out verse three. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Just pause there for a moment. So here you have this curse of the, of the Moabites. And then there's this promise this, through Isaiah that says, but if there is a foreigner, who would join himself to the Lord, then he would not be cut off. Oh man, do y'all see that? This beautiful picture. This foreigner who, who's an, an alien to the promise, a stranger to the promise, if, if he or she would join themselves to the Lord. And isn't that exactly what Ruth does to Naomi? She joins herself to Naomi. There's this placing of the faith that happens that I don't want to get ahead because Luke could be there in the next couple of weeks, but, uh, but I want you to see that. There's still that promise there that even in this, that there's this gospel promise. And I wanted to make sure it's very important to the story of Ruth. Anyway, back to Moab for a moment. There must have been a very bad situation for a man to take his family there. Some people believe he was just being a good husband and a good father, trying to get his people to a land where there's food. And we could see, ah, I get it. But more than anything, it's probably a picture of Elimelech not trusting God at his word where God says, what if my people will call upon me? I will heal their land. Like that principle is more of Elimelech not trusting in God's goodness and his faithfulness, but making provisions for himself is really what this story is. And so that I think, and so that's what's happening here. It's a sign of the lack of trust. Some must even said that he was following in the pattern of Abraham, Abraham and Jacob. If you read Abraham and Jacob's story, there was a famine and they went to Egypt. There was a famine and they went to Egypt. And so the the difference is that they were led to to this place. No, anywhere does this say that they were led into Moab. And so I believe, I choose to believe it's in their 
rebellion or in their lack of trust. And so that's the, the setting, if you will. Now let's look at a few of the characters. And this is where it starts to get good, by the way. First of all, I right, said so there was this, in the days of the judge's rule, there was a famine. A man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in Moab. He and his wife and two sons, verse two, we're finally at verse two. The name of the man was Elimelech. Let me show you, let me show you some good news, you ready? What's the context here? This was the time when there was no king and the man did what was right in their own heart. Do you know what Elimelech's name means? God is my king. Like, here's this story where man is doing whatever they want and there is no king, so they do whatever and the first person we're introduced is God sovereignly saying, no, God is king, right? You get, you got, I want you to see that this morning. And so uh, he says, there was a man named Elimelech Then the keep reading it says, and then the name of his wife was Naomi. So Elimelech's name means my God is king. And Naomi's name means uh, to be pleasant, to be uh, delightful, if you will. And ultimately, this, her story is the main, really the main story. There's the, there's the Ruth and Boaz, but what you see is this story of Naomi's journey. They had two sons and their names were Milan and Kilion. Milan's name means sickness, and Kilion's name means wasting away. And so I don't know if they were born sick, and that's the reason they named them. Like they, they were born very sick, and they named them these things, or this is after the fact, maybe through their names that changed for the story. Like we don't know what that is, but we know that's the names that they have here. Verses three through five. So, so far, we know the setting, what's going on, we know the people that went to Moab. Now, <clears throat> look at verse three. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with two, two of her two sons. These, so this would be Milan and Kilion, they took Moabite wives. No, that's, you're not supposed to do that, right? They took Moabite wives. <clears throat> the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. Uh, and so, we know that Orpah uh, was the one who married Kilion, and chapter four, verse 10 tells us that Ruth married Milan. And so, anyway, so now we have these two Moabite women. And then, it says they lived there 10 years. Verse five, but both Milan and Kilion died, and so now it's Naomi, it's Orpah, and it's Ruth that are left. That's the setting of this story. There's your story, there's your key people, there's a situation that's going on in the land, and so, that's the story, judges, famine, Moab, death of men, three women remaining. So for this morning, what's the take home truths? That's the, really, these five verses, there's some cool points like with Elimelech's name, and. Yeah, but how does that make me feel tomorrow? Like, like, what are some things I can take home with me right now? Number one, if you're taking notes. It's from this text, I can know this because it's in scripture, is that God is, con God is concerned about the lives of ordinary, normal people. So Justin, where do you get that from? Because so far, we hear, through scripture, we hear about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all these main leaders and these guys and judges and things like that. Then all of a sudden, we have a story called Ruth about this ordinary man named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, their two sons and their son's wives. Just ordinary people. And I don't know about you, but it's, there's, I need that truth this morning because I know how ordinarily normal I am. Anybody else feel me there? Anybody else, does it encourage anybody else just to know that, hey, hey God, God is concerned about your life. He, he sees the ups and downs. He sees, listen to me, he, he sees the, uh, the, your story. He, 
not just judges and rulers and leaders and important people, but normal people. They, God is concerned about the death of a child or the death of a husband, that God is concerned about the, being able to have children and not being able to have children, that God is concerned about your future and your pain that we see, because it's written in passage here, is that God is concerned about the ordinary everyday life, the ordinary mess that we find ourselves in day in and day out that God is concerned about those things. Yes, this book is about the storyline of redemption. Yes, it exists to, to set up the bloodline of David. But listen to me, we cannot miss the fact that God cared about a man named Elimelech, his wife named Naomi, their two sons, and their two sons' wives. He cared that, that when Naomi's husband died, that, that he strategically put somebody there with her. And then when her sons died, that, that he had two daughters, and one would stay there. God was concerned about ordinary people. And I feel like somebody needs to be told that this morning. Because I know how ordinary feels and sometimes ordinary doesn't feel good. But it's good to know that God cares about the ordinary person. Second, and don't read into this more than I'm about to say, but when we leave the promised land searching for life, and happiness outside of it, we usually end up finding death and bitterness. And that's what I mean by that. For the child of God, whenever we, th- we decide, hey, I'm gonna step outside this promised land to be able to find happiness, to be able to find life, does it ever go the way that we want it to? Does it ever? When we choose to, to provide for ourselves and trust in, instead of trusting God, when, when we choose to do things on our own, usually we end up finding despair. Right? We usually end up finding, hey, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And we can see that here. And you know what? Because they, they, they were sojourners. But they really ended up being there for 10 years. And that's the story of rebellion, isn't it? It takes us places we don't want to go. We didn't want to go to Moab. It keeps us there way longer than than we wanted to be there. And it costs us more than usually we can pay. But when we choose to do things on our own strength and our own will, it never, for the child of God, it never, it never turns out good for us. Number three, third truth for you to take home this morning. God is faithful even when we are not. God is faithful even when we are not. This is in context that there was no king and the men did what was right in their own eyes. They left. There was spiritual infidelity completely sweeping a nation. Yet through these ordinary couple, God would preserve or create a bloodline from a king who would eventually end up in Christ being born through that lineage. A people who had turned their back, God says, now I'm I'm faithful to my promise that I made to Abraham. Or you can go further to Adam. Or further than that, that I made to myself. I'm faithful to that. Even when you're not, I'm faithful to that. Even when Elimelech chooses to go somewhere else, God remains faithful. Faithful to his plan and faithful to his people. Number four, Fourth truth is there is no story too hopeless for God's redemption. Like there is, is there more of a hopeless situation in all of scripture than those first five verses? Israel's a mess. There's a famine. Elimelech takes his wife to a foreign land that they shouldn't have been at in the first place. He dies, so she's left by herself. Her kids die, and she's left with two Moabite women. 
Could there be more of a hopeless situation? There's no hopelessness that's greater than God's power to redeem. Because the redemption is more than just a marriage. It's Naomi's, who's, who's gonna be their heirs? Who's, who, who's gonna leave, who's gonna carry their name? Who's gonna, who's gonna carry past the torch? Who's going to, it, it, it's, it's a whole story of hopelessness, of emptiness. But there is no hopelessness. That's greater than God's power his kindness, and his power. If he can redeem a Moabite woman, then he can you too and your story. Lastly, how does this point to Christ? And I'll be done with this. How does this point to Christ? First of all, uh, I think with the name of Limelech, I think that's pointing to a king. And then, like I said, there's, the whole thing ends in the end of Ruth about David. We know the, how the, the, the anointed would come and sit on the throne of David. Like we, oh, you have to be able to see that. I think that is a picture that's a pointing to Christ, that this is a picture. Uh, later, I don't want to get too far ahead, but these characters also give us imagery of, of Naomi. You see Israel, this, this person who was a part of the family of God, yet wasn't a believer. They weren't, you know, they weren't redeemed. They were, they were there, but they weren't redeemed yet. Then you have Ruth who represents a Gentile who, 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 who isn't a part of the promise. And then you have this guy named Boaz who will humiliate himself to, to purchase both of them. I mean, there's this, it's the picture of the gospel all the way through. How else does this point to Christ? This little old lady, mobile woman named Ruth, if you turn to Matthew chapter one, her name comes up again. Verse five, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, <clears throat> by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. This is the genealogy of Jesus. Here's this story. There was a time whenever the judges were ruling and there was no king and Israel was disobedient and rebelled and then there was this famine and so for some reason, this is God's, no, you, this is God wasting nothing. This is even in Elimelech's disobedience that God had a plan that through the, the seed of Ruth that one day a Messiah would come. Like it, I, that just came to me when I was standing up here. Like this is, that picture of like God's got a plan, he knows what he's doing, this is beautiful, y'all. Last, how does this point to Christ? Did you check out where Elimelech was from? It was a little place called Bethlehem. Come on, a place called Bethlehem. And they even used the <clears throat> Ephrathites there which is cool because in Micah chapter five, verse two, we read this, but you, O Bethlehem, uh, uh, I can't even say it now, Ephrathah, uh, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth from me. One who is a ruler in Israel, who's coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. How does it point to Christ? Because it's in every, almost every verse in the first five verses. Elimelech, Bethlehem, Ruth, it's all there. Man, I'm thankful for the whole counsel of God's word, by the way, because they didn't know what was going on then. They were just living their life. Oh, but there was a God in heaven who was orchestrating everything and hands on everything, sovereignly working all things to the council according to his will. And now some thousands of years later in Laurel, Mississippi, there's a group of people that are sitting inside a church and there's a preacher standing on stage reading a story that God had preordained and predestined before the foundation of the world to tell you that God is good and his salvation is great. And it's not 
It's not plan B. It's the most beautiful, if you think Ruth is a beautiful romance story, catch it as just a chapter in the whole book of a redemptive storyline. Not of a guy named Boaz to a lady named Ruth and her mother like Naomi, but to the whole world. God, the creator of heaven and earth says, here is my redemption. This is the way I purchase you. Man, if I don't, if I don't like to fire your woods wet, you've been outside too long the past couple of days because it's been raining like crazy. Get inside and get in the word and let it warm your heart. Hey, if you don't know this salvation, if you don't know this gospel, I invite you to. No matter where you find yourself this morning and, and, and if you're in cloud nine or if you're in the fog nine, God cares about ordinary people. He does. He knows you. He knows your pain. He doesn't take it away, but he knows. And he can walk with you through it. Because he's got a good story for your life too. I'm gonna pray that I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna be standing down here. Luke will be close up front too. If you wanna come talk, if you need to pray, you can use this altar as a, at this front of the stage as a place to pray. What we see in the next chapter is that Naomi, she gets really honest. Some may say too honest. She gets really honest. And I'm, I'm so, so excited to hear Luke teach on that. But we don't have to see Naomi's story to know that that's what happens. You can read the book of Psalms to know that sometimes we just need to let it out. Not to my cousin, not to Dr. Phil, or to Oprah, or to Oprah. But we need to bow before the King of Kings. And what we talked about last summer in Psalms of Refuge is to process our feelings in the presence of God. Not outside of his presence, but in his presence, process our feelings. I invite you to do that. This morning, if the Lord is calling you to trust in Jesus for salvation, I invite you to do that. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that as it's going out, God, that your spirit has taken it and spoken to hearts this morning. Oh God, I pray for for us as a church, God, that we will grow more in love with your word and your great story. We thank you for the book of Ruth. <laughs> we praise your blessing upon it as we dive into it. God, I pray here in this moment, God, that we will respond in a way that you're leading us to. If we need to pray with someone, if we need to pray by ourselves, if we need to sing out, if we just need to be silent, if we need to sit down, if we need to stand up, God, that we will respond in a way that you call us to. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.